and welcome back. And you know, I need I need a break. I'm not I'm not just from the ads envoy. I mean, I do need a break from the ads envoy. It is taking no prisoners whatsoever. Uh, but I I need a I need a mental reset. Um, a lot of the projects in this room are very similar in the problems that they have, but they also require a very similar type of thinking to overcome those problems. And sometimes it's good to just completely change gears and do something wildly different. And you know what? It's been a while since I've turned some wrenches, so let's go work on some cars. You see, before I got bit by the vintage computing bug, my first passion was cars, namely classic Japanese cars. This one here is my daily driver. It is a 1988 Nissan 300ZX SS, three liter turbo, five speed, viscous limited slip in the back, goes like stink and looks amazing while doing it. I bought this car when I was 18 and I have had it for the last 22 years. It did spend some time being dormant recently for about six years or so, but I did get it back up and going, went through and fixed all the things that needed fixing, and it's back to being my daily driver. I absolutely love this thing. It's a family member pretty much. But while I was living in Japan, and this was stuck here in America, I needed a toy there as well. And so I bought this 1973 Isuzu Bellet 1800 GT. 1.8 liter single cam, but it's got a set of side draft Mikuni carburetors on it, four speed transmission, big open differential in the back. It really could use a limited slip, but this thing is the definition of fun. I bought it as kind of a basket case in Japan, restored it there, brought it back here to America, and I drive it like I stole it everywhere I go. It is an absolute riot. I actually have a video dedicated to pulling the carburetors off of this, cleaning them up, and then taking it for a drive. So if you want to see a little more about this, check that video out. And then finally, over here, my wife and I had to go to Japan for about uh, five months after we had already moved back here to the States, and we needed a car while we were there. So we bought this 1991 Honda Beat. It has a little three cylinder. It's four valves per cylinder, but single overhead cam only. It has individual throttle bodies, revs to 9,000 RPM, and the engine is in the middle. This thing is essentially a go-kart with license plates. We brought it back with us and <laughs> it's, it's a little exciting driving here in the States because it's about a third of the size of everything else on the road. But if you think about it like a go-kart that's pretty quick, it's a ton of fun. But all three of these work perfectly. Well, perfectly is not entirely accurate. Uh, they all have little niggling problems here and there, but that's just the nature of having projects. But I can get into any one of these three, start it up, and drive all the way to Dallas if I wanted to. No problems whatsoever. So these are not the ones that need work. The one that needs work is inside. This is a 1967 Austin Healey 3000 Mark III. This car is very special to me because my father bought it before I was born. Here's a picture of me standing in the driver's seat of this very car when I was one year old. It's been a family member longer than I have, and I don't care what name it says on the title, this will always be dad's car and it underwent a full frame-on restoration about 30 years ago, so it's starting to show a little bit of age, but we've been driving it and enjoying it ever since. It has a three liter straight six with a four speed manual transmission and a two speed electronic overdrive. It makes around 160 horsepower through two British made SU carburetors, and therein lies our problem. Granted, the wiring on this thing is made by Lucas, who is known as the Prince of Darkness, but electrically, it all seems to be working okay for the moment. The carburetors is what's causing us issues. The choke doesn't want to pull out quite right, and when it does pull out, it never goes back in. And whenever you do actually get it running, it 
fire backfires and pops and bangs and it's just generally upset so something is up with the carburetors maybe we've got a stuck or sunk float so we need to get them off of the intake manifold and over onto the bench give them a solid clean and see if we can figure out what's making it run so terribly before we go through the effort of removing the carbs completely, let's first take a look at the floats. And I'm going to enlist my good buddy Carlos to help out today. He has way more skill and talent at this than I will ever have. But after getting beat down by an old Triumph bike, I had to bribe him with beer to come work on another old British thing. To get the top hats of the float bowls off, it seemed like a super easy single bolt affair at first glance. Even still, after battling with it for too long, the only way to actually get the top hats off was to remove one of the air cleaner bolts because it was just preventing the top hat from sliding out. So access is brutally tight and I can only turn the wrench for like a sixteenth of a turn each time, but eventually we got there. Finally, I could get the top hats free and pulled out of the way, and just as I feared, both floats are doing a very poor job of actually floating. The back carb in particular is very nearly completely sunk. I'll use two screwdrivers to pull the float up far enough for Carlos to get a hand on it, and with both floats out, listen to this. Yeah, kind of hard to float when you're full of fuel. So let's punch a hole in these guys to drain the fuel out of them. I'm going to use a tiny 0.9 millimeter drill bit that I normally use for drilling through holes on PCBs. We drilled a hole on top and bottom and just jiggling it around, you can see the fuel just drizzling out. The uh, glass jar I'm using here was already dirty, so pay no mind to that, but look at how much fuel we got out of both floats. It's a miracle the engine even ran long enough for me to get the car into the garage. Let's see if we can find the leak by putting a little compressed air into the hole we opened up. And yeah, look at all the bubbles. The entire seam looks to be compromised. Now, I am absolutely going to order new floats, but that's going to take probably a week to get here from Moss Motors. In the interim, let's take a swing at repairing these floats. We've got nothing to lose. If they sink again, we're right back to where we are right now. So we'll start by cleaning up the brass as much as we can. We want a really clean surface to work with, and you can see just how filthy they were. So Carlos and I just pulled out some Scotch-Brite pads and got to work. I had to promise more beer to keep him motivated, but before we do any work on these involving heat, we definitely want to evacuate all the gas from the inside of the float. You know, so we don't create a mini bomb or something. But to do this, we held the float underwater and let the inside fill completely, forcing all the gas out. It took a while, but it was fun to watch the bubbles, if I'm being honest. Then we used the air hose to blow all the water out, which was also quite fun to watch, giving us a clean, not dangerous piece of brass to work with. Prep work is like 90% of the work no matter what you're doing, but it's especially important here because we're ultimately trying to create an airtight seal. After drying them off with my wife's hairdryer, I, I mean my specialized heat gun, I pulled out my trusty Weller soldering iron and cranked the heat up to max. The solder I'm using here is the same Rosin Core 6040 lead tin solder that I use for everything, and getting the float hot enough wasn't a problem at all. The old Weller put so much heat into the float, it would burn your fingertips off if you touched it. But the issue we kept butting heads with was impurities bubbling up from the original soldered seal. So, you know, the bigger the blob, the better the job, right? Right? But anyways, there we go. That's looking like it should seal up all right, maybe. A nice, moderately consistent covering across the entire seal. Now, I made a few fatal mistakes here. I sealed the holes we drilled, then tossed the floats into the lathe to sand down the seal. I was worried about side-to-side -side clearance, but I should have actually checked first as there was actually a ton of clearance, so this whole step was unnecessary. And to make matters worse, I think this sanding, as nice as it made them look, actually opened up a ton of pinholes. The floats just immediately 
immediately sink again, so I had to pull them out and redo all my work, this time without the sanding. At any rate, let's get them back into the carbs, then we need to get the top hats back onto the float bowls, making sure to snake them under the choke cable, not over it, I made that mistake a couple of times, and let's give it a test fire. Hmm, she's still popping and banging and not happy. Let's check the plugs. Maybe they can tell us a story. I'll start with cylinder number five here, which I picked because it was the easiest cylinder to get to. And actually that looks pretty good. A nice chocolate milk color on the porcelain, although the gap looks a little tight. Uh, let's check the rest of the plugs. And oh, the back three looked all right, but the front three were atrocious. They were so dark and sooty, it was hard to get the camera settings just right. Cylinders one and two were bad, but cylinder number three, man. <laughs> this one was just completely black. So much so the camera just sees it as an infinite void of doom. This would definitely cause it to misfire and bark at us, so I need to add a set of spark plugs to my online shopping cart next to a set of new floats. But in the meantime, let's see if we can revive these. I'll soak them in carb cleaner and then use a wire brush to break loose all the soot from running way too rich. Spark plugs are tough as nails, and if you can clean the worst of it off, a good running engine will burn the rest off and bring the plug almost fully back to life. As I finish each plug, I hand it off to Carlos, who is checking the gap, and these were gapped all the way down to about 22 thousandths, which is a bit too low. We're going to open them up to about 30 thousandths and see if that helps get a better burn. A difference of just eight thousandths seems tiny, but you can clearly see the difference here. The plug on the right is the old gap, and on the left, the new gap. Then comes the fun of getting all the newly cleaned plugs back into place. Cylinders two, three, four, and five are no problem, but cylinder six has a water petcock in the way, and cylinder one has the generator and coil in the way. Cylinder one is so tight, I had to actually use a U-joint on the wrench to get it in and out. Maybe someday I'll make an offset coil bracket that moves it a few inches out of the way. That'll make it way easier to change that plug if I ever have to on the side of the road. At any rate, let's fire it up and test it again. This time though, I'm gonna put the mic at the rear of the car so we can listen to the exhaust. Hmm, it's a little raspy and still a little stumbly, but immensely better than before. Enough so that I think with a little heat in the cylinders, it'll clear up. So let's back the old girl out into the daylight for the first time in a few months, then pull it around front and splash some water on it. Now while I wash this car, let me just say a few things. There's an entire probably billion dollar industry built solely around how to best wash a car. And how I'm doing it, I'm sure is going to trigger some fanatics out there. But let me explain. Just like how I approach old computers, these cars were built to run, to be driven like hooligans and to make you feel like a 19 year old who took dad's car out without permission which ironically is something I've actually done some 20 years ago with this very car. But as a result, the paint has nicks and dings and cracks and scratches all throughout it. This is not a concourse level car that would be at home on Pebble Beach, no. This is a car that's meant to be fighting for traction as you blast down a back road. So yeah, enough washing, let's take it for a drive. It's kind of hard to get a judge for how the engine's running, 
Once we get out of our driveway here, we'll really open the taps and see what she feels like. All right, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Oh man, I have no idea if you can hear me. The top is down, so the wind noise is probably gonna be out of this world. But the engine feels amazing. Those floats were definitely causing problems. What happens when those floats sink? The level in the carburetors rises, the fuel level rises, and it runs richer and richer and richer. But, oh man, it's back. You lean into the throttle, and it just goes. Oh, in 1967, this thing must have felt like a rocket ship, especially on the small roads of England. Oh man. It's not all roses though, because the brakes feel like hot garbage and uh, I've worked on them before. Has big discs up front with huge drums out back. They are power assisted with a uh, vacuum servo. I have replaced the master cylinder. I've replaced the booster. I've replaced the front calipers. I've replaced all of the soft lines. They still feel like trash. <laughs> Maybe I have some bad uh, wheel cylinders in the back, but I don't know, I'm gonna have to dig deeper into that. The engine feels amazing, but I think we can get it a little bit further. The uh, twin British made SUs that come on these engines are not great. The Japanese made Hitachi SUs are way better. I don't think anybody's ever swapped those onto the Healy straight six before, but I think it can make a massive difference, especially if we bump up to the triple SU upgrade that the uh, Works race cars did. So triple Hitachi SUs, I think on this motor will be stunning. The suspension, I recently replaced the shocks on all four corners and it feels awesome, but the front toe feels a little bit out. It's a little darty, but turn in is amazing on it. So it's kind of a, you know, a little bit of a balance that we got to strike there. But, oh man, I love this car and I am so happy that it is back in action. Let's pop it down a couple of gears here. Slow it right on down here, get into second gear. We'll open the taps one last time. There she goes! <laughs> Sometimes you just really need to reset your brain and there's no better way to do that than in the driver's seat of a 1967 Austin Healey 3000 Mark III. I want to thank you all so much for watching today and I hope to see you in the next episode.